uh, very exciting session for us today. Uh, we're really totally delighted to have Kevin Layton Brown as our uh, speaker. Uh, Kevin, you should know this is only our third seminar in, in the series from the Schwartz Riesman Institute. So you're part of our inaugural crew and we're delighted to have you here. Um, so uh, Kevin is a professor of computer science at the University of British Columbia. He holds a Canada CIFAR AI chair at the uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And he's also an associate member of the Vancouver School of Economics. Uh, and he has a PhD and an MSc from Stanford University and a BSc from McMaster University. Kevin studies artificial intelligence, mostly at the intersection of machine learning and the design and operation of electronic markets and or the design of heuristic algorithms. Uh, Kevin is a AAAI fellow and a distinguished member of the ACM. And uh, this, is, this is from Sheila McElrath's note, who was uh, unable to join us for this intro. So she has told me that he's accumulated all sorts of honors and awards for his teaching, uh, his research, and in software team competitions. Uh, most notably, an NSERC Stacy Fellowship, Outstanding Young Computer Science Researcher Prize from the Canadian Association of Computer Science, and a Killam Teaching Prize at UBC. He's on all sorts of editorial boards, has been a visiting professor, researcher at all sorts of top places. And Sheila says, he's also an extraordinary and well-costumed debate moderator. We might need an explanation of that one, uh, Kevin, who has graced the stage at many AAAI Oxford style debates and no doubt we could have used him last night. Uh, right now he's co-chairing AAAI 2021, which is a huge top international AI conference. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Layton Brown, who is speaking about modeling human playing games from behavioral economics to deep le learning. So take it away, Kevin. Thanks so much. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Um, so I, I understand that the setup is to do a, a 45 minute talk with then kind of half an hour or 45 minutes for questions. Is that right? That's, that's the plan. Yes. Uh, it, do you guys have a, a strong preference for that format as compared to letting people interrupt me throughout? Entirely up to you. If you'd like to let people interrupt you throughout, uh, we can, um, people have control over their own mic, so they are, they can speak up. Uh, we'll, we'll step in if we need to. Alternatively, if people want to send messages through the chat, I can try and track and, and let you know that there's a question. Yeah, I, I think it'll be more fun for all of us if we, if we make sure. it interactive I and mean, we're all sitting in our bedrooms looking at monitors as it is. So, so let's uh, give this as much of an illusion of human interaction as we can have. <laughs> all right. Good, uh, good. Yeah, if you can watch the chat, uh, that's sort of hard for me to do while I'm speaking. So, I'll I'll, I'll do that. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, so yeah, don't don't be shy. I, I know many of you are economists, and uh, you know it's a, a sad thing in an economics talk if you make it past slide three. So uh, feel feel free to go for it. Uh, I tried to make first slides light to to make it hard for you, but even so. Um, so uh, yeah, let me just acknowledge that um, most of what I'll be speaking about today, uh, actually I think virtually everything I'll be speaking about today is joint work with uh, James Wright, who's a, a former student of mine, now a professor at the uh, University of Alberta. A um, couple of other co-authors here and there that I'll acknowledge, but uh, James is, uh, is a fantastic guy that you should know about if you don't yet. So, Okay, so let me uh, motivate kind of generally this, uh, this notion of behavioral economics, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you, but just to get us all on the same page. Um, so, you know, first of all, let's, let's think about game theory, right? Game, game theory is sort of easy to malign, but there's, there's something fundamental about it. If we didn't have game theory, we would need to invent it. Um, it's a general mathematical approach for thinking about um, how we reason in novel, arbitrary strategic situations that we might encounter. So. Um, you know, it seems sort of fundamental that we would want some kind of mathematical tools for thinking about how people uh, reason strategically. And once you have such tools, and if you believe in them, then um, you can start to make predictions about counterfactuals and use that to do mechanism design, which is from the computer science approach, uh, maybe um, the most exciting thing about uh, game theory, that if you can start thinking about the design of non-cooperative protocols that are gonna have kind of good social properties um, as compared to their alternatives, um, taking into account the way people might act in their own interest. So 
Um, so that's kind of the, the upshot of why we might want such a thing. Um, the catch is that the, the quality of this sort of design is going to depend on the accuracy of these predictions. So uh, if I want to do, you know, this non-cooperative protocol design that's going to produce, um, you know, protocols that are um, robust to, to people's own kind of selfish reactions to the protocol, um, that, that only works if I have a good sense of how people act in their own interest. And, uh, you know, as as you know, if you've uh, spent any any time with game theory in practice, if you've ever taught a game theory course, um, game theory uh, is beautiful and uh, and sometimes accurate, but but sometimes really breaks your heart by failing to to capture the way people really think in the world. So, um, let the, there are a variety of ways that that uh, this um, gets illustrated, but but let me uh, let me do it by considering one of the strongest kinds of predictions that game theory can make. Um, short of a dominant strategy, which is you know, essentially saying that a, a game sort of devolves into a single player interaction, this is pretty much the strongest thing game theory can predict, a unique dominant solvable Nash equilibrium. So um, the, the famous um, beauty contest game is, is an example of, uh, of such a, a game, um, probably familiar to many of you, but uh, for those of you who don't know it, it says uh, pick a number between zero and 100. Um, imagine that you do this with all of the other people in this Zoom call right now. So imagine that you were really, um, you're not playing this game in the abstract pen and paper as a homework exercise, but you're actually doing it with the real human beings whose videos you're looking at right now. And you're all gonna pick some number and the number closest to two thirds of the average of all of the numbers that everybody else picked is gonna be the winner. And your goal is to try to be the winner. And um, how would you actually play? So, so take a, this is more fun if you actually think about it. So, so take a moment and think about how you would actually play. Um, and uh, if we were in, in the same room, I would sort of ask you to show your hands and try to, try to get a sense of what you would really do. Uh, I think maybe, uh, am I bold enough to try to do that on Zoom? How many of you have your videos on? Let's, yeah, let, let's not, not do it, I, I'm not that brave. Um, but uh, think about what you would do. Here's what I will show you, though. The, the New York Times upshot, which is the sort of economics column in the New York Times, actually conducted a sort of uncontrolled experiment with, as it turned out, it more than 60,000 people who read the upshot and uh, you know, gathered this data where, where people actually called in to see what they would, uh, or, you know, wrote in to, to see how, how they would do this. Uh, so I'm hearing a noise from somebody. Maybe uh, can somebody... Uh, who's a host of this meeting, mute everybody. I, I think I got it, I got it. I think. Thank you. Um, so, so the first thing to notice about, uh, about this game is that it has a unique um, Nash equilibrium, right? a, a unique dominant solvable Nash equilibrium. It, it's, if you're familiar with Nash equilibrium, it's pretty easy to see why um, zero, zero is the only Nash equilibrium because uh, you know, you're, you're trying to pick two thirds of the average so you can keep chopping off the interval um, by two thirds of the, the previous interval and eventually ending up with this sort of strong peaked prediction that everyone, if they're rational and believes in the rationality of others, uh, should, should, should uh, say zero, zero. Um, here's what actually happened when the upshot um, conducted this uh, sort of uncontrolled experiment. Um, people uh, made the reports that you see here and uh, I'm going to come back to this picture a bit later in the talk and, uh, and try to interpret this a little bit more. Um, you know, for those of you keeping track, the average was 28. And so the winner was uh, with the people who said 19, which was two thirds of the average. And, um, you know, I guess what I, what I want to impress upon you at this point is, first of all, the people who followed the game theoretic prediction, you see some of them really said zero, sort of five and a half percent of respondents uh, did pick zero. These are the the people who believe so firmly in game theory that they, they disregard the notion that anyone else in the world might not be a, a hyper-rational game theorist like themselves, um, or they didn't think it through. But, uh, you know, if, you, if you're playing as real people, then you probably think, you know, even if you understand what the Nash equilibrium is, that doesn't mean that other people are actually going to follow the Nash equilibrium. You know, you're trying to say two-thirds of the average of what all of these other people are really going to do. So, saying zero was not a good move in this game because, uh, because it involved actually reasoning about how other people play. Um, the other thing I want to point out at this point is just 
that it's not all random garbagey noise, right? It isn't like just anything goes. There's, there's no way that you could possibly sensibly play this game. There are some really pronounced peaks. So there were real patterns to the way that people play this game. And as a machine learning researcher, this is kind of exciting because it says, you know, there's something to be learned here. There's, uh, there's some principle underlying the way that people approach this game that, you know, you might hope to capture something about. So, so I'll, I'll return to this picture and try to, uh, try to dig into it later. So that, let's uh, avoid the temptation of doing that now. But, but I just want to note to you that there, that there you know, certainly is some noise going on here, but there, there are also some pretty um, striking patterns. So, you know, th this takes us to uh, you know, the motivation for why we might care about behavioral game theory. You know, if, uh, if what I care about is uh, advising um, clients in telecommunications auctions about how they should bid against other telecommunications companies, as, you know, I do in some of my consulting work, um, you know, you probably don't want to use behavioral game theory models in a setting like that, right? That's, uh, that's a setting where you, you have hyper-rational opponents who are thinking very hard about what they do. You know, if you're, uh, if you're a country thinking about the behaviors of other countries, you know, that, that's maybe not a place where you want to use behavioral game theory. But if you're in a case where you're really thinking about regular people making actual choices, then the notion that they're perfectly rational, uh, you know, according to this kind of standard game theoretic model, seems really to be a lousy prediction. So um, if I want to think about the way unsophisticated humans are going to play, um, then I need some model of, of people. And uh, that's, that's what I want to think about um, throughout this talk. So, so here's the, the setup that I want to think about. Um, I, I want to think about a, a case where a person is presented with an arbitrary simultaneous move game. Um, for kind of technical reasons, the simultaneous move assumption is going to be important. Uh, the two-player assumption is not going to be nearly as important. Uh, what I'm going to say is essentially going to generalize uh, to arbitrary numbers of players. Um, but I want to think about a case that, that doesn't anchor on, on any given game. I want to think about how we reason generally about uh, any given game at all. So, you know, I described the rules of a game to a person that they might never have thought about before. For example, I might say to you, think about the game Rock, Paper, Scissors, but where, uh, where the, the rewards or penalties are $1, except if you win with Rock. If you win with Rock, the rewards or penalties are $2. So if your opponent beats you with rock, you, you pay $2. If you win with rock, you get $2. Otherwise, it's rock, paper, scissors. So, so this is probably a game that you, know, you now understand, but you haven't really thought about before. You know, does this mean you should play more rock or less rock? Or, you know, how does it quite work out in the Nash equilibrium? You, know, you, you, might, you might not immediately um, be able to see it. I'm then going to take a human subject and say, imagine you're, you're playing this game against another person for real money. What do you want to play? And she says, you know, okay, I'll play paper. I say, thank you very much. I'm going to record your answer. And then I do this under lab conditions. Uh, well, so first of all, let me, let me just write this down and say, you know, the way I want to think about this is that I, I showed her the game matrix. Um, I said, you know, here, here's the setting that you're in. Um, you're the role player. Um, and then I observed this action count, uh, this uh, uh, Dirichlet distribution that said she played paper 100% of the time. And I, I kind of conceptually, I want to think about this on a population of different people. And in this population, maybe she was unusual. Maybe most people play scissors. Um, so maybe I see whatever distribution of reaction counts I see. Um, and if all I cared about was this one game, this seems pretty easy. I just show a lot of people the game and you know, that must be what people do when they're presented with this game. But what I really want to think about is being given a data set of such games. So um, being given a whole variety of of dissimilar games, um, each of which has one or more people being shown this game. And what I want is a model that will predict people's distribution over actions, not on these given games, but on other games that were not shown at training time. So I'm going to evaluate how well, um, you know, how good a behavioral model I have by assessing the extent to which it can predict the distribution of play across people from the same population but on games that I didn't see before when I was learning my model. And so, um, so you know, not by accident here, I'm showing you a game that isn't even the same size as any of the games that were in my training examples, uh, because that's something that could really happen, right? Yeah, Nash equilibrium can be evaluated on any game. And similarly, I want something that I can really think about just on absolutely any input. And then 
I actually go and measure this on people and you know, I see what they did and you know, maybe it's similar, it's not quite the same. And then I want some way of saying um, you know, how I would score the model and ultimately um, reward the model based on its proximity to what people did. Um, let me, let me, uh, I'll get more uh, mathematical on the next slide and talk about how I score things, but um, you've all been uh, very quiet up till now, so maybe I should pause and see whether uh, anyone has anything to say. Somebody should break the ice and then it'll be <laughs> all Kevin, it's, it's, Kevin it's, it, it's Peter Lowen. I would just, I, I, I would really be interested in hearing just your, just your thoughts, like your priors on whether you think that there are, there are different types of people in the population to the degree that they're actually able to engage in, engage in really complex strategic inference. And then what the, what the, what the individual level correlates of that are and what that means for your models. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's definitely gonna show up in the models. I, I definitely think that is true. Uh, you know, there, there, there are such variations in the population. Um, the approach that I'm gonna take um, throughout the entire talk is, um, is, is not being able to identify members of the population. So I'm, I'm not gonna be doing, um, you know, individual level modeling of, you know, something you might imagine doing is if all of these observations had people's names associated with the observation, I might say, you know, that Peter sure knows how to play games. You know, he's doing fancy things. And, you know, on the other hand, Yoram just seems like he's just reflexively picking the lexicographically first action shown to him every time, um, you know, as befits the Simpsons background on his Zoom profile. Um, so, you know, maybe I would start to learn something about individual people. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that I can't do that, that I, I just see counts. Um, you, you certainly would make sense to do that. Uh, but, however, it doesn't stop me from saying, you know, the population seems to contain some Peters and some Yorums. Like, there are some people who are doing fancy things. There's some people who are doing simplistic things in, you know, various proportions. So we're definitely going to allow for models that have that kind of flavor. Does that, uh, does that address what you're asking? Yeah, it does. From a, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Let's see if there's anyone else. Um, hi, Professor. I wonder, hey. like, because over time, sometimes games, uh, like, people's strategy on how they play game changes. Just as they, they're more familiar with the game or just because whatever reason. So do you, how would you address something like this that happens in real life? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I'm not going to think about that at all. Uh, I'm going to think about um, what economists call initial play. So I, I really want to think about a setting where people play a game against an opponent once uh, and then never see the opponent again, never play the same game again, go on with their lives. Um, this is not because I don't think that what you just mentioned uh, is important, but because it has to be grounded in this sort of initial setup. And I think the initial setup can still be modeled. You know, the, the upshot setting that I described to you, for example, you know, the upshot only held one game. You know, they, everyone, you know, reported how they were going to play the beauty contest. Some number got um, announced and that was the end of it. Uh, and as you can see, there was a pattern to what people did. So uh, it's undoubtedly true that if you then iterated among those people, they, they would start to react to each other's behavior. You know, there would also be something to model there. I think that's, that's important and worthwhile to think about, but I think it's going to depend on the initial play. And, and that's the part that, that I'm going to try to think about here. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so, can you explain how this is uh, different from, let's say, cross validation, um, where you exclude uh, some of the observation, some of the games, but you know you try to predict uh, based on you train the model on some and then. No, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's precisely what we're going to use here. So maybe let me, uh, for, for people who in the audience don't know what cross-validation is, let me, uh, let, let me describe this slide and then I think I'll have the, uh, the answer to, to uh, your own question. So, um, so, so what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I've got a data set. Ultimately, what I want to learn is a function, right? I, I want to learn this sort of blue arrow that maps from an arbitrary game as input to a, a predicted distribution as output. And you know, the predicted distribution is the green thing, and I want the, the red thing, the prediction, 
to be as close to the green thing as possible. And I want this to be true. Uh, I want my, my blue function to generalize. I want it to be able to do well on inputs that it didn't see. So if I try to say this mathematically, um, you know, the way that I can set this up is I take my data and I divide it before I do anything into um, two different data sets at random, a training data set and a test data set. And I'm gonna do this in such a way that the games um, in the training data set don't occur in the test data set. Otherwise it would be easy, right? So I'm gonna partition it based on games. So some of the games, all of their observations are gonna go into train. Some of them, all, all of them are gonna go into test. Then I'm gonna take this test data set and I'm gonna set it aside and not look at it. Um, then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be fitting some model. Um, conceptually, this model is gonna have some parameters. You know, maybe they're weights in a neural network, maybe they're numbers that mean something to me as an economist. Uh, whatever they are, I've got some set of parameters that defines what my model does. And I want to find values for those parameters that maximize the likelihood of the training data. So in other, in other words, I wanna say, um, given the way the model works and given the parameters, I, I wanna ask how likely is it that I would have under that model ended up with the data that I actually got um, given that, that model. Um, and then I'm gonna tweak the parameters to try to make it seem as likely as possible. So, so for example, if, um, if my model is, you know, is some distribution, let me just imagine there's just a distribution. Um, and what I saw was everybody played action A. Um, you know, uniform randomization over all the actions could have produced that, but it's pretty unlikely because, because my, my observation is very concentrated and my, my prediction is very diffuse. And so that would be kind of a low likelihood prediction. And if I have a parameter that says how skewed is the distribution, as I increase the skew towards action A, it's gonna make my observations more and more likely. And so when I try to find the maximum likelihood estimate, it's gonna do this. It's gonna pick something that um, you know, never says, you know, it's certain that I would get this data, but it says that you know, it starts to look more likely than, than the uniform model say. Um, then having, having come up with these parameter values, I'm then gonna set aside my training data, keep only these parameter values that I fit. And I'm now gonna ask the same likelihood question about the test data. And I'm gonna say, whatever patterns it was that I saw in the training data that I used to fit the, the parameters, are those patterns also um, holding up in the test data? And bearing in mind, these are now new games. So it's not about matching the histograms, it's about you know, matching the process that produced the histograms you know, in some different setting. So to what extent do I succeed in doing that? And, uh, and that's the way I'm gonna score my, uh, my eventual prediction. Um, so now getting to Yoram's question, uh, this you know, idea of test training split to evaluate generalization is uh, you know, just, just kind of the notion of generalization and machine learning. If I wanna estimate this generalization error with lower variance, I can do the test training split many times and I can average the predictions and that'll just give me a lower variance estimate of the, uh, the generalization error of my model. And so I'll do that just to get, uh, just to be able to report um, estimates uh, with lower variance. Kevin, can I ask you a question? Um, so I, I'm curious about your prior on the process or model, whatever it is that, that is actually generating this so that, that you know, it, it, these are truly, you said, arbitrary games that have not been seen before. So one of, one of the ways of, or maybe it's a critique of some behavioral economics, is that it's kind of, it, it, there's actually, it, it's somewhat atheoretical, right? The, it, 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 all we can do is run the lab experiments and people pay the, play the divide the dollar game this way and they punish in altruistic punishment games in these conditions and 30% seem to care about fairness. And none of this is actually, there's no theory behind it, it's sort of a critique. So, so you have to have some kind of a theory behind this. This is actually, these behavioral ways of the, 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 the gameplay that can look atheoretical, there's actually something going on there that our process here can discover. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, I think uh, if, I, if I'm understanding you properly, what you're calling a theory, I would kind of call a model family, right? So there's some set yeah. of rules that you might have that, uh, that, that might say, you know, how do, I, how do I come up with a strategy in a game? You know, maybe my model is Nash equilibrium. Maybe what I do is I solve for the Nash equilibrium and then I uniformly randomize over the Nash equilibria in the, um, in the case where there are multiple equilibria and that's my probability distribution. You know, that's a well-defined decision rule that I can do in any game. 
Um, so, you know, maybe that's one thing that I do, or maybe I always play the Nash equilibrium that has the best payoff for me, breaking ties lexicographically, or, you know, I, I can imagine, you know, a decision rule like this, right? Just, I, given the game, I have some way of arriving at an action, or, or maybe I find the biggest number in the game matrix and I play my, the action that corresponds to that number all the time. You know, there's a different rule that I could play that, you know, maybe isn't as sophisticated as the Nash one. Um, so, then I could have a, a sort of family of rules like that, that I, as an analyst, come up with. And I say, this is going to be my model family. And the parameters are going to be, you know, the weights that I, you know, the, the sort of free variables that I have uh, left open to myself that say, you know, what probability do I have of doing this versus that? Or how many people of this kind are there in the population versus that? Or, you know, these, these other kinds of questions that I might have. Um, and so when I'm doing this model fitting, you know, I'm doing that kind of selection among um, whatever the analyst has chosen to leave free. Um, now, um, something you might be wondering is, you know, where did M come from? Like, how, how did you make these decisions? Um, initially, uh, as this talk begins, I want to say I defer to the wisdom of the behavioral game theory literature. You know, we're going to begin by really just thinking about what people in the behavior, behavioral game theory literature had already done. Um, eventually, the answer is going to be it's some crazy morass of deep learning, and uh, we're going to you know, make very few commitments. Um, so that's that's sort of the journey that that we're embarking upon here. Um, great. Anybody else before I uh, get into some more of the specifics? Uh, yeah. Yeah, please. Was I the only one? So just, you guys just to, it out yeah. amongst yourselves. Yeah. So uh, about Julian. So I, I think uh, th there is some view of behavioral as being theoretical. I don't think that what Kevin is going to do. It's going to be, as he said, it's going to be routed in models of uh, game of play that are uh, players that are not necessarily um, fully rational or don't believe that others are fully rational, but these are still theoretical models uh, that are very rigorous, so that it's not an atheoretical uh, approach. So just uh, for the rest of the audience too, so I think. <laughs> yes, I'm being a bit rude sense. about behavioral economics. Yeah. No, I just... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I should stress that it's theoretical in the sense that it makes analytical commitments to what would happen in counterfactuals, but it isn't theoretical in the sense that we're going to prove theorems to, to justify, uh, you know, what we're, what we're going to claim. Sorry, can I ask a question, Kevin? Yes, yeah. Hi, uh, this is Pashutan. Um, so I was wondering if uh, it's a fair characterization to say that your data set is hinging on the fact that people are acting based on their um, system system one reasoning to borrow uh, that term from um, uh, from Daniel. Oops, yeah. Whoops, um, you just muted yourself, Pashtun. I'm not sure if you're done. Oh uh, yeah, I was done. I said I said yeah. Is it fair to say that it's a, that it's a system one type of behavior? Or? No. I don't think so. I think actually, uh, you know, many of the behaviors that we end up seeing are are probably pretty hard to describe as system one behaviors. I think, I think some of you know, I've sort of uh, maybe we should revisit this at the end when we have a bit of a vocabulary for talking about it. But I, I think we're going to end up claiming that some people are are doing things that might be system one, and many people are not. Um, but I think at, at this stage in the reasoning, what I want to say is. I'm agnostic about how people are arriving at the answers they're arriving at. I just see it as a phenomenon to be modeled. And you really what interests me is that there's a pattern to be found. Sure, but, but if you assume that everybody is ultimately rational, then you can, you can argue that all of them are going to get to the Nash equilibrium or something like that. Sure, so, but I can, there's plenty of system two reasoning that isn't uh, you know, von Neumann style hyper-rationality. Right? There, there's lots of other ways that I could be doing something that isn't kind of an instantaneous gut level decision that, that also isn't, you know, solving integrals and optimization problems. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, it's Hugo here. So uh, when you try to estimate parameter values, do you need to specify a functional form beforehand? And yeah. if so, how do you choose your functional form? Um, I absolutely do. This is, this is all going to be parametric. I mean, even, uh, even deep learning is a parametric approach. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you on subsequent slides what, my, uh, what the functional forms I consider are. And throughout the talk, I'm going to be varying the, the hypothesis case. Thank you. Thanks.
Yes, I see you. You trying to get in? I, I uh, uh, not brave enough to pronounce your name, but uh, uh, it, yeah, it's it's Daria. Sorry, you you just ignore the J. It's it's a weird spelling. Uh, hi, Kevin. Um, I am wondering if you somehow control for sort of the features of the games that you use. So you know, like they're games that have a unique Nash. They're games that have multiple Nashes. They're sort of strategic complementaries and substitutability. Sort of, do you? Is there some sort of structure to that? Um, yeah, uh, let me see what my next slide is. Not not quite yet. Um, well, so um, maybe it's here. So so I'll, I'll tell you that we ended up doing um, an analysis on basically all of the behavioral game theory data we could find in the literature. Uh, we just essentially combed the internet, everything people had made available about this setting that was um, simultaneous move unrepeated. Um, we took it and we threw it into a giant bucket and we treated this whole meta thing as one distribution. Um, um, sampling the same number of samples from every uh, data set. Um, you can see that these data sets all contain many games. Uh, they contain, you know, as few as eight and as many as 20 games. So uh, all of them contain sort of a, a heterogeneous sense, uh, population of games. In a games and economic behavior paper that we ultimately wrote about this work, we did the kind of analysis you propose, where we we looked at our results, um, sort of broken down by dominant solvable games, uh, games with unique equilibria, you know, games with sort of various economically interesting properties. Um, but um, the generic results that I'm going to present here are just kind of across the board, uh, just treating the, the set of games uh, as a sort of uh, you know a given thing. But okay. But you should know that this set of games, um, you know, spans a very broad class of games. It isn't like I'm doing this only on ultimatum games or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe I'll, uh, let me go on. So um, along the way, I'm going to kind of call out um, research questions, which is things that I'm still thinking about. And maybe in some cases, I've got something to say about. Sometimes I don't. I'll give them a blue background when I say it so that they'll distinguish it from things that I have more definitive things to say about. Um, so you might wonder whether log likelihood is really the right loss function to be using here. Um, it's certainly hard to think about. It isn't the intuitively the, the thing that you would most like to reason about. You know, most people much prefer to think about accuracy. Um, but accuracy really doesn't work because we're, we're comparing samples from a probability distribution, which is you know, a finite set of, of discrete observations, to the distribution that we claim um, generated them. So you know, let's say, I have four samples from a coin, and those samples are heads, 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 tails. Um, is it accurate or inaccurate to say those were generated by a fair coin? You know, obviously, that, that's just not a sensible question to ask, right? I can talk about how likely it is that it would be generated by a fair coin, uh, but I can't say something really about accuracy. So, so you know, if I want to believe that you know, mixed strategies exist in the world, then accuracy is just a, a mismatch here. Um, but, but that's not enough to say that therefore we're stuck with log likelihood. Um, there are some unpleasant things about log likelihood. Um, its units are uninterpretable. So I, I just end up with these weird negative numbers uh, or you know, negative exponents. Um, and furthermore, um, even the scaling is kind of awful because likelihood always gets smaller as I have more samples and as I have more actions in the game. So there isn't even really a scale to these numbers that I can easily think about. What I'll do when I report empirical results is to talk about um, uh, sort of to normalize by the likelihood of uniform random predictions. And I can say how much more likely a prediction is than uniform random prediction, which gives us some kind of scaling, but it's still not perfect. Um, furthermore, there's kind of no lower bar. So there's no measure of how close we are to perfect prediction. And uh, if I have two games in my data set and one of them has more samples than the other, then the game with more samples is going to drive the loss more than the other one. Uh, to some extent, uh, as you see on the, the next slide, I can deal with this by subsampling and ensuring that every data set is represented to the same extent. But that causes me to throw away data, which, you know, if you're a machine learner, that should break your heart. You should never be having to throw away data. So, um, so, so this is all a little bit sad. Uh, I, we don't think it's the right loss function. We're kind of actively thinking about alternatives, and it's an interesting conversation to have there. Uh, but for the moment, log likelihood is what I'm going to use for this talk. Um, so I told you about the data that we used, uh, and again, I just I want to just emphasize, um, you know, we didn't conduct human subject experiments ourselves. 
God bless the people who did. It's a tremendous amount of effort. You know, they had to actually get people into a lab and, you know, get human subject approval and actually pay them real money for literally every data point that they had and explain the rules and make sure that they were playing the game and not some version of the game that they concocted in their heads. And, you know, it's all really very tricky. And, uh, you know, this is really a meta-analysis on top of this behavioral work by other people. Um, if you're a machine learning person, you might say, this just seems like supervised learning, right? You know, you've got observations and you've got labels for those observations and you want to you know, repeat those labels. So, so you know, why is, this, why is this so fancy? You told me this uh, story about behavioral economics, but why can't I just use my favorite uh, supervised learning method? Um, well, it's not simple classification because we want to return a probability distribution rather than a single suggestion. So, um, so you know, the most obvious things that you might know about wouldn't work. Um, but of course, there's machine learning that tries to predict probability distributions, which is called des density estimation. Um, it isn't straightforward density estimation either because the distribution size varies with the input, right? So if I give you a game that has two actions for player one, I want a distribution over two things. And if I give you a game that has 10 actions for player one, I want a distribution over 10 things. And I want the same model to, to make those two predictions and to know which one to give me. Um, so th this is really telling me that I'm not trying to predict a distribution. I'm trying to predict a mapping from games to probability distributions over the actions in those games. And uh, this problem of predicting mappings is a much less traditional machine learning problem. Um, the closest match sort of in the off the shelf machine learning approach is uh, the family of discrete choice models. So if I say the set of choices is the role player's actions, the features are the payoffs, um, then I, I can uh, find these kinds of mapping uh, models in the literature by looking in, in what the discrete choice people say. So there's uh, the most obvious thing I could do is a kind of logistic regression approach where I, I, I predict the, the probability or sort of the potential for playing each action and then I normalize by the potentials of all the actions and that gives me my distribution. Um, and I could also do like a mixed logic model where I have a bunch of 10 different latent classes and I, I predict uh, you know, across the different latent classes. So, um, so maybe we should begin by saying what would happen Kevin, if I, uh, Kevin, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, just a, a question from the chat. Did all the games um, in the data have discrete action spaces? Yes. Um, yeah, I think they varied from uh, two to um, dozens. So they, they varied quite substantially, but they, they were all discrete. And indeed, everything I'll say today is about the discrete case. Um, so the, the follow-up to that is, if that's the case, then why does it rule out classification for machine learning algorithms as a method of uh, probability estimates? Seeing as like some of the, the activation functions like softmax, et cetera, aim to return a probability. Um, uh, sure. So, I mean, that's not really classification anymore, right? That's really kind of density estimation with a with a max at the end to do classification. Um, I mean, I guess I would see that as a as a density estimation approach. Uh, I, I think the pro the problem there is instead the, the 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 fact that the size of the distribution has to scale with the input. I see. Okay. Thanks. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. So uh, as far as I remember, in most of the data that you analyzed, a uh, subject in each game had to choose uh, a single action. Uh, what, uh, now you, at the end of the day, you're trying to estimate some kind of a mixture in the population, but what happens if the a subject actually is randomizing at the individual level. You cannot observe this randomization. So let's say there's a 51. I I, I want to play strategy A with 51%, strategy B with 49. But you know, you force me to choose one, so I choose A, and you never observe uh, the B. Well, that should be fine because on an on expectation, I'm going to see the B is two, right? I, I'm getting you know many samples from these strategies from different people. So, you know, if, if in the population people are playing this kind of strategy, log likely who's going to do the right thing. It, it depends how subjects, you know, uh, they, they understand they are playing one game. So it depends how they randomize and how they break this. Uh, well, I mean, if the if the strategy that people are playing is is to it's say purely if it, 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 it's purely mixed, yes, I understand. But if the, it's not, then it, 
So a bit more problematic. Um, sure. So if it's the case that people um, look at their distribution and rather than sampling from it, they they give the map estimate of the distribution. You know, they, For they, example, they, like, yeah. Um, then you know what I'm going to recover is is the mode of the distribution, not not the whole distribution. I guess I would claim that in that case, the mode of the distribution is what I want to recover because I'm trying to model initial play. And so in, in the scenario that you've set up, that is how people initially play. Um, okay, so let me go on. So with uh, this uh, discrete choice setting, um, let, let me just show you I can do this. So I can say um, on my data set, um, Here's, uh, here's what happens. So I take the logis logis logistic regression model and the mi mixed logic model, um, and I, uh, they, they have parameters. Uh, I fit those parameters, right? The, the parameters are these uh, alphas and uh, betas, and I, I fit the alphas and betas uh, based on my data uh, on the training set. I've got the, the training set graph here in gray just to, to show you that it exists, but also it's in gray to show you that that's not what we ought to care about. Um, and then I do the same thing on my test data and I report the result and I do cross validation. So I do uh, many random splits between training and test. And that's where I get these error bars that you see in the box plot. And so you can see how much variation I'm getting arising from the split between training and test data. And, um, and here's what you see. So my, my negative log likelihood um, is, so this is the log likelihood. So this is the exponent of the, the likelihood, um, the, you know, the negative exponent. So how close is it to zero? And I get these different numbers. Um, and you know, the first thing that you should see is, you know, well, great. So mixed logit is better. You know, small numbers here are better. Um, so mixed logit is, is doing a better job of making predictions. But as I warned you, the, you know, I can't really interpret the numbers on this scale. So you know, what should I make of all of this? Um, and uh, one thing I can do, as I was suggesting to Jillian earlier, is I, I can think about the, the log likelihood of the um, uniform prediction. So what if I was just to predict um, that I just uniformly randomize over all of the actions in the game, which is a different number of actions in the different games. So in each game, I just predict the uniform distribution. Um, that also gives me some likelihood, which is a, a sort of reference point. If I can't do better than that, then I would say I'm not making a useful prediction. And what you can see is that logistic regression on the training data is nailing <laughs> randomization. Uh, and it's actually generalizing worse than randomization. It's overfitting the data and it, it's learning basically nothing. And the mixed logic model uh, is doing a bit better. Um, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we're gonna have to see later on whether this is a meaningful amount better. It's gonna turn out it's not especially better, but, uh, but right now we don't know that. So, so all of this is just sort of to motivate how we might empirically uh, study these things and to say, you know, this isn't so far working very well. So, so I'm instead going to turn to behavioral economics and behavioral game theory has proposed a variety of different hand tuned models that are based on psychological insights. So there's a quantal response equilibrium, level K, cognitive hierarchy, noisy introspection, quantal level K, quantal cognitive hierarchy. And there's this whole sort of um, cornucopia of different uh, models that think about this setting that I care about, which is being able to make a mapping from an arbitrary game to a distribution over what one person will do in that game in the unrepeated setting. Um, there are two key ideas that underlie the best performing models in this space. Um, and rather than telling you, you know, all of these models exactly how they're parameterized, which is a bit of a slog, I'm just gonna tell you sort of qualitatively what these two ideas are. Uh, so one of them is quantal utility maximization instead of, um, traditional utility, perfect utility maximization, and the other is iterative strategic reasoning rather than uh, equilibrium reasoning. Um, let me uh, note that you know, it's an open question whether there are other strategic reasoning phenomena that we should try to capture here. Um, we're going to end up thinking just about these two because that, that sort of spans this space of models, but I think uh, it's very likely there are other things we might want to capture as well. Um, should I go on or are there questions coming up in the chat? Uh, no other questions yet. We got about 45 right. minutes to go. Cool. Yeah, I see that. Um, okay, so, so quantal utility maximization says, um, let's imagine that uh, you know, I have three options available to me with different expected payoffs. Uh, you know, one of them is a dollar and a penny, one of them is a dollar, one of them is a quarter, right? Best response says, 
well, take the dollar and a penny, right? That's the best one. So you should take that all the time. Quantity utility maximization says, I'm gonna predict that people play high utility actions more often and low utility auctions rarely, but not never. So it would predict a histogram like this. And it's gonna have a parameter that says, um, how do people trade off between things that are similar and, and things that are dissimilar? Um, you know, how, how big do utility differences have to be before people um, care about them? Iterative strategic reasoning says um, that people think ahead, but they don't think an infinite number of moves ahead, the way a Nash analysis presumes that people think. So it's grounded out in the idea of what's called level zero reasoning, which says there's some non-strategic thing that we use just to ground the model. We don't really think that there are level zero people in the world, but, but we sort of anchor our theory in the idea of a level zero pe person. So we say um, almost always in the literature that the level zero people just uniformly randomize over all the choices that are available to them. Um, then a level one person uh, best response or response quantily maybe in, in some sense to the level zero players, level two people respond either to the level one people or to both the level zero and the level one people, depending on which model family you're thinking about and so on. So you get sort of more and more sophisticated levels of people up to some kind of level K, which is sort of the fanciest people in your, mo in your uh, model uh, hierarchy um, who are doing kind of K steps of reasoning about uh, people below them. So uh, coming back to, to one of the questions we had before, you, know, you can see this as a kind of system two reasoning, but, but it's not like perfect rationality. It's some sort of finite look ahead. So let me come back to this uh, uh, upshot graph that I showed you before uh, and argue that uh, this gives us some kind of empirical evidence for the, this idea of iterative strategic reasoning. So uh, for example, people playing 50 uh, might make sense as um, a level zero strategy because it's the average of uniform randomization over uh, the interval between zero and 100. That, that might explain why somebody would say 50 in this game. Uh, it's not two thirds of the average of anything um, particularly focal. Um, if you think that's true, that, that 50 makes sense as a level zero strategy, then, um, then two thirds of that amount would make sense as a level one strategy. And two thirds of that amount would make sense as a level two strategy. So you can see these pronounced spikes uh, happening in a way that suggests that there are a lot of people doing one level look ahead, two level look ahead in the population. You know, indeed, um, there, there seem to be a lot of people who say, ah, 50, maybe that's a good thing to do without really thinking about their opponent at all. And then there's a lot of other people who say, aha, I, I'm gonna get the jump on those people who are all gonna say 50, I'm gonna say two thirds of 50. And then there are you know, yet another big population of people who say, aha, I'm smarter than those people who do the one step look ahead. I'm going to do a two step look ahead. Uh, all of these people don't really think about the fact that you know, there are going to be all kinds of other people in the world. Um, but uh, you know, notice this, uh, yeah, this, this uh, seems to explain these big spikes. Um, furthermore, we can even go further with it, right? Um, saying 100 is definitely level zero, right? Think about it. It's not two thirds of anything that was available to you as a strategy you were allowed to play. Uh, so there, there's no way you can be thinking about your opponent and playing 100. Um, two thirds of that gives us a big spike and two thirds of that gives us another spike. So, you know, again, in this uh, you know, data that I didn't make up that just got published in the New York Times, um, you can see um, some at least kind of anecdotal evidence that people are thinking about uh, the, this kind of iterative reasoning. That this is something that people might do. So if I build models that are based on these insights, you know, I have like 50 page papers where we really dig into the details and I'm, I'm gonna spare you all of that analysis, but here's kind of one graph to tell you the story. Um, the best of those models that I showed you um, fit on our data set and then um, extrapolating to the, uh, the held out test data is doing vastly better than the mixed logic model. So quantile cognitive hierarchy is a model that says, um, it essentially combines these two approaches. So it says rather than best responding, people quantally respond. Um, and they're, um, they're doing this iterative reasoning. So the, the population is divided into level zero people and level one people and level two people, level three people and in different proportions. And for each, uh, for a person of, of each type, they respond to the true truncated distribution of people below their type. So all the level twos know about the existence of level zeros and level ones and they respond to the kind of joint probability of both of them. And then they, they quantally best respond to what all the level zeros and level ones would have done 
ignoring the fact that there are other level twos and that there are level threes. You know, just as we saw in the New York Times data, all those people playing level two weren't thinking about the fact that there were other level twos out there. Um, however, if we dig further into this and do an analysis of the parameters that we ended up fitting in this model, um, we find something disturbing. In fact, we find something that caused our paper to be rejected by Econometrica because the reviewers said this was impossible. Um, sadly, it wasn't impossible. It's really, really strong property of our data that comes up again and again. We've done a lot of analysis since. Um, our models are really, really certain that there are a lot of players uh, of the level zero type. Uh, so it, uh, at least at the time that we started doing this work, it's sort of an article of faith in the behavioral game theory literature that the, there weren't any level zero people. The level zero people were just kind of a fiction that defines what the level ones and level twos do. But our model families were saying, in order to get good uh, performance, we want to fit a large fraction of level zero people. And that's problematic because this, this uniformity assumption was a pretty arbitrary thing that we cooked up, right? Or not us really, but the, you know, we don't have a good reason for saying that, that level zero people ought to be randomizing uniformly. And so if the model nevertheless believes with high confidence that like a third of people are level zero, this might be evidence of a misspecified model. So um, something that we're um, interested in as a research question is whether we can find ways of fitting models that better constrains our parameters to their intended economic interpretations, right? This was not the intended interpretation of the level zero parameter. Um, so um, I'm going to change gears, uh, drill more into this idea of level zero, but if there are questions, maybe now's a good time to take one or two. Yeah, actually, I, I had a quick question. Oh my goodness, where's my video? Um, I was gonna, just going to ask if any of your data sets had um, individual differences in working memory span. I have absolutely really? no idea. Uh, these are uh, typically psychology undergrads, you know, in a lab study. Um, you know, we're incredibly heterogeneous and just having munged together nine different data sets. I think we eventually did it with 13 different data sets, um, you know, which were conducted by different researchers, paying people in slightly different ways where we normalized dollar amounts, but otherwise they were kind of right, different. Right, right. You know, I, was I was just think, thinking so that's, probably, the, that, that's the kind of individual difference measure that might be predictive of whether somebody would be a level two or, is it, or one or zero. Maybe. I mean, I'll say that I uh, tend to uh, do these kinds of experiments uh, just like ad hoc at the beginning of a talk by asking people to show their hands. Uh, a lot of people play level zero strategies, uh, even who are professors with PhDs in economics departments. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that it's explained fully by working memory. I mean, uh, I, I won't identify uh, the person, but I had a, a meeting with a distinguished professor at the University of Toronto earlier today and that person's research group, and we did a game, and 50% of the group played a dominated strategy as their action. Um, so, so I'm not, working memory might contribute to it, but I, I think it might be more going on than that. Okay, thanks. Um, have you considered the stakes of some of the games? Because sometimes people play uh, like non-optimal strategies just because when, when the stake of the games are low. Like if you look at the, the data from the New York Times, you, you see there's like a relatively, relative spike at like 100. And people know that there's just no way they're gonna win with 100. And that they were playing it, like they're, they're essentially just like, they're, they're also not playing it like uh, randomly either. They're, they're just messing with the game or something like that. So like there are people who, who have these kind of behaviors, which are like, if you think about it from the game series um, um, stance, it seems completely illogical, but. I think that's fair. Um, I, I mean, I think what I would say is just, you know, there's a pattern there. I'm interested in modeling the pattern. Um, you know, I think uh, it's certainly true that if I was to imagine changing the stakes of the game, I would imagine that um, people's behavior would change. I think if I had enough uh, data across different stakes, I would expect that the model would start caring about the stakes. Um, you know, quarter response is not scale invariant, so you know, it might actually turn out that uh, you know the stakes uh, end up mattering in the in the model. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I still think this is something that we could try to capture. Um, should I move on? Is there any, uh, somebody else waiting? Um, can I can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, Hey again. Um, so, um, so with, with this level zero stuff, you mentioned that you cannot identify 
people sort of, you know, between the games, you don't know, you know, what decision John made in game A and game B. And I think that, you know, sort of, if, if you were to look at that, maybe you could, you could find sort of a way around, you know, why you have so many level zeros is maybe those people are just inconsistent um, across games. And then sort of, you, you cannot really categorize them sort of within the whole data set. They're just weird people. That, that's possible. Let's, uh, let me actually uh, present the next thing I want to present, which I think is a bit of a response to that. And then uh, let, let's have a conversation about it, if you like, after I do, because I think uh, certainly at this point, when all I'm telling you is that uniform randomization is getting a lot of weight, you know, it looks like it might just be sucking up variance in the data, right? There's just something the model can't predict. And so uniform randomization is the best way that it can sort of describe all of this sort of residual variance that isn't described by everything else. Um, so in a, that's why I say it might be evidence of a misspecified model. It's just saying, you know, all of this leveled quantal response stuff, you know, there's obviously some signal there where it would just predict 100% on level zero, but it's not catching any, everything. So this is sort of the grab bag that just soaks up everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that may well, you know, based on what I'm showing you now, that may well be true. You know, spoiler alert, it turns out not to be true, but, but it looks like it might be. Yeah. Okay. Can, I, can I ask a bit mechanical question? Sure. Uh, so um, the level zero, so of course, if somebody played uh, above 67 is level zero. So um, the question is whether you take this and take the extrapolate for that. So just how did you get to the one third number? Or well, so this is really saying when I fit a quantal cognitive hierarchy model on this crazy data set of, you know, 47 different games in the training set, you know, involving all these psychology undergraduates, you know, usually they're economics. And then, I, and then I do like a very complicated, or maybe they're economics, I don't know. Um, and then I do a, a, a really complex Bayesian analysis of parameters, which which is a tricky thing to do. So actually that would take like 10 minutes to tell you even what that means. But, but I wanna get you know, posterior beliefs over the parameters in the model. I don't just wanna do point estimates anymore, but I wanna actually understand uh, how confident the model is about its parameters. Um, then how confident is that model that, that about the, the population proportions of level zero and what values is it setting? And what it's saying is, it's really important to the model that it have a lot of level zero people. I see. Okay. Um, and so, so, it doesn't, so it doesn't really absorb just the noise that you have. Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't say that it, that's not why it's important. I mean, so Daria's argument, as at least as I responded to it, might be like, look, you know, the, the cognitive quantal hierarchy thing is predicting something pretty concrete, right? It predicts, you know, that you quantally best respond to um, whatever the uniform person would have done. And then you quantally, you quantally respond to that, you quantally respond to that, you know, you have you have only a couple parameters about what you really get to do. So if you see wildly different stuff happening in the game, the only explanation you can find for it is uniform randomization, right? So, so maybe you just put a lot of mass on uniform randomization because like who's to say what people are doing? You know, that's just the only way you can explain anything. Um, or maybe people are really uniformly randomizing. You know, we, we, don't get, we don't have a good way of telling those two things apart here. I see, okay, thanks. Okay, so, um, so what James and I uh, did is, is we, we took really seriously this idea that maybe there are a lot of level zero people in the population, um, but, um, but we felt like um, this notion that level zero people would uniformly randomize was a little bit ad hoc. Um, so you know, we sort of already had this Daniel Kahneman kind of idea of you know, level uh, system one, system two thinking. You know, if you sort of think of level zero as system one, um, you know, you know, essentially, I think what we want is level zero is non-strategic, right? So the idea of level one is that you're responding to beliefs about what the level zero people are going to do. So we want to say level zero is everything you can do that isn't forming beliefs about others and then responding to them. So it's, it's non-strategic, but that doesn't have to mean that it's stupid. So, um, so what might it be? Um, we tried a lot of different model classes, and it was really hard, actually, to come up with something that was better than cognitive hierarchy. We tried many things. This was the best thing. So this is going to seem a bit ad hoc, but I, but also I think kind of interesting. And uh, it was important that it worked the way that I described. Um, so we had five binary features that ask things like, is this action the best in the deterministic worst case? Or does this action contribute to my own highest payoff outcome in the game? 
or does it contribute to the social welfare maximizing outcome or to the least unfair outcome or does it minimize my regret? Uh, and we ask, it's important that these be Boolean. So is it the best one or is it not the best one? You know, is it tied for being the best one or not? Um, then we say that, that each of these features is informative for a game if it distinguishes at least one pair of actions in the game. So it could be that, um, that every um, outcome in the game ties, right? Every, like they, they all contribute to the highest payoff you can get, or they all minimize, they uh, have the same effect on your regret. Or, um, you know, if so, uh, we say that feature is uninformative, but we say a feature is informative if it divides in a given game, um, some of the actions into one class and some of the actions into another class. And then for each, here's our model, for each action, we compute a sum of weights for the features that are both informative and that evaluate to, to one, that kind of fire, uh, plus a noise weight. And then we normalize all of that. So we say for each action, our prediction for that action is going to be this linear model that says um, this noise weight W0 plus the sum of the product of whether the feature was informative, whether it fires, and the weight for that feature. And then we take all of this and normalize it to get a probability distribution. And this is going to be our model of what a level zero person does. Um, then we're going to take that whole model of level zero, which has a bunch of weights in it, right? So it has six weights, W zero, the noise weight, and the five weights for the five features. All of that is my level zero model. And I'm going to take all of that plus the other stuff in co cognitive hierarchy and build a new cognitive hierarchy based on this being level zero. And that's got like 11, 12 parameters. I'm going to fit all of them. And I'm going to uh, evaluate all of that. Now, something you should be worried about in machine learning is as you have more and more parameters, you might just start using them to overfit your training data. That's why we think about generalization, because as you have more and more parameters, you, you have more and more ability to fit your data. But if you don't generalize properly, if you do it badly, you're, you're going to get really good error on training data, but then really bad error on the test data. So that's something we should watch out for here. And uh, here's what we see. Um, it, it actually leads to a, a pretty enormous improvement in performance. Um, it doesn't look so enormous the way I'm drawing this because I've anchored things by the, uh, the, the uniform prediction and the, uh, the logit models, but uh, it actually gives a, a factor of 10 to the 20 times likelihood improvement moving from the, uh, the uniform level zero model to the, uh, the, quantum, the quantum cognitive hierarchy model with this level zero prediction. So, um, really quite, and uh, you know, very low uh, error estimates. So this gives us very strong evidence that building a, a better model of level zero performance uh, really improves the, the behavior of these models. So uh, responding to, uh, to Daria's concern, um, you know, there really is something about level zero that we can fit here that dramatically improves the quality of our predictions. Um, that tells us that, you know, maybe it was the case that when all I allowed level zero to do was to uniformly randomize, there was some degree of misspecification, but, but there's nevertheless something I can really capture by thinking in a more nuanced way about level zero people, right? There might be more going on than just I'm not being able to find people. Kevin, uh, can, I, can I ask you yeah. to go back to the, uh, the five features? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, the fairness one is because so, so, I was I was going to ask so um, so if we think that that we're playing a game where there is normative salience so there's no normative salience to the New York Times like pick a number sixty thousand people like you know it, it's not a divide the dollar game it's not an ultimate game Actually, like I, in that game fairness would not distinguish the outcomes because there's no fair outcome right only one person wins like right. Right, and, and so, so that's what I, I, I was sort of I think if, if you're playing a game that has normative salience, um, then you know we're we're kind of in that game. We're embedded. This is what we were talking about before, right? We're embedded in a, in a much bigger game. Um, and and I, I so I I, I was going to ask about that, and so I see that here, but I also see it. Uh, you know, you've got it in a weighted sum with these other features. Uh, would that allow us to capture that if we actually split out our games that had a nor had normative salience from the ones where, um, you know, it's I mean, even the New York Times game, that's kind of a, a that's it's it's a it's strategic, but it's not not in the way we normally think about that, I guess. Um, would we I mean, do it's definitely strategic in the sense that it's asking you to respond to beliefs that you have about what other people are going to do, 
right? I mean, I guess that's how I'm defining yeah. Sputnik. And, and yes, and, and I appreciate right? that, yeah. Yeah, uh, but but it's it, it, it's not like the, uh, yeah, so it, it doesn't have this, I was say, it doesn't have this, what I'm just calling normative salience, but it's potentially yeah, subject to another set of rules about, so I, I was kind of wondering if, if by mixing those two kinds of games in here um, that you are missing, because people are actually playing yeah, a different no, I, game. I think you're, with I think you're bang on. Um, so I think something I don't have in the slides, but uh, it's in the paper and it's true, is I, I recall that fairness was by far the most important feature in our models. Um, it, it's a really strong uh, element of uh, what's going on in these levels in our models, which I think um, makes sense both in our intuitive, uh, you know, notions of, of how we think in a level zero way. And also, I mean, I know your work on, uh, on norm evolution, you know, really you know, captures and tries to explain this notion that, that people are very motivated by these sort of pro-social motivations that, you know, in a sense, proceed the way they reason in a given game. So I think we're, we're certainly seeing evidence of that. And, and you're right, we've thrown all these games kind of together without social explanations, you know, in a big bag. And so we're getting sort of the, the ex-ante effect here across the classes of games. But it's, it's quite likely that dividing them up would, would increase the signal here. But I would also imagine that, that your structure here, your, your approach here, sort of creates the opportunity to test some of those hypotheses about actually people are playing a different game. They're playing the, the what's the right way to play games game rather than the, Fair enough. Yeah. the divide the dollars. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it looks like Daria is back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, it, it's actually sort of, I, I like this, this the, the features stuff. Um, but I, like, I think sort of that there's one clarification that I, I was hoping you could give. So to do with the with the, the random, the uniform random people, are those sort of independent, sort of if we're talking about, you know, a game where there are more than two, two people playing, are those uniform random draws for every one of them or are those sort of perfectly correlated? Um, you know? um, no, it's certainly not correlated. I mean, I think everything we're doing here, I recall it's for two players, but if we were to generalize it, um, these um, layered, mo these leveled models are saying you respond to the expected payoffs um, from the distribution of people below you. So it would all be expectations based on these distributions. Yeah, it's just, Without, but but not with correlations. It, it, it's just that sort of it, you know the, the literature. I think like sort of it's it's not in one of the papers that sort of you had in the you know in the data sets that you're using. But there was certainly one paper by by Costa Gomez and 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 Crawford where they they've looked at sort of two assumptions for level zero. Okay. Um, so, and one of them, sort of like they, they were N player games and they would look at sort of whether it's, it's a perfectly correlated thing. So it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, that five actions, one, two, three, four, five, and sort of, you know, I am one player and then there are three others. And I'm thinking that they all acted in a uniform, in a uniform, but correlated fashion, or I can model them as, as being independent draws. And at least for some classes of games, um, the perfectly correlated stuff fits better. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it was just, but if, if they're independent, then yeah, sure. All right, no, I mean, I, we're modeling it as being independent. I mean, I think, I, I think the way we're thinking about it is more along the lines of what Jillian was saying, which is that, you know, non-strategic reasoning, you know, maybe doesn't anchor so much in, in uniform randomization, but it anchors in certain kinds of social normative priors about how, how to think about a game. And when we're strategic, you know, we don't necessarily follow those priors, but we kind of begin by reasoning about those priors. So we maybe start by saying, you know, the, the fair welfare maximizing thing is really interesting to me. Let, me. let me kind of start by thinking about that. Let me think about other people doing that. And then let me think, you know, is there some way, you know, if I get a lot by best responding to that, you know, maybe I'm gonna best respond to that. But, um, but that's sort of where I anchor. Okay. Okay, cool. Ke Kevin, um, both you have Spider Man outside your window, and uh, well, I was wondering if he was going to show up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, or Jason Bourne, I don't know. Um, uh, and Avery uh, has a question in the chat. Avery, you just want to ask it, or I could read it here. Avery, are you there? <laughs> Uh, oh, I can, sure, I can read it out. Um, I was wondering about the significant amount of people who chose zero, um, especially given what Dylan was just talking about in fairness. It, it seemed like there were a rather significant number of people who chose that. If I'm, the slide's not up, but. Oh, you mean in the, uh, the New York Times thing? Um, yeah, there were, there were some. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. So there was yeah. kind of like five and a half percent. I mean, you know, my sense is these are people who took a game theory course and they're trying to be clever. 
Um, okay. <laughs> I think it's pretty hard to understand why you would think, you know, if you really understood what the exercise was, to think yeah. that literally every other person was going to say zero. But um, that would be the mutually cooperative game, right? Wouldn't it? I don't know about cooperative, it would be uh, the, the equilibrium. I mean, it's the only game where if you know what the other people all do, you don't update your strategy. So, Avery, you called this utopian. So, okay, explain why zero would be utopian. Oh, if I'm, I mean, I maybe just don't understand, but um, if everyone decides to pick zero, then everyone will have got the right two thirds of the answer. I guess in this case, um, yeah, th there's something sort of happy about the equilibrium, which is that everyone sort of has an equal chance at winning. Um, there's no particular reason why the equilibrium has to be good, though. I mean, another game I've thought a lot about is the Traveler's Dilemma. Um, you know, there the equilibrium is sort of the worst outcome for everybody. Um, you know, we see that in like, you know, Unrepeated Prisoner's Dilemma, the equilibrium is the worst thing for everybody. So really all that's important about the equilibrium is that it's stable with respect to the truth. So if you if you learn about other people's behavior, the equilibrium is the case where you wouldn't then wish that you could change what you did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I guess you're right that in this case, there, there's, a, there's a sense of sort of equalness about the equilibrium. Yeah, I, I think Avery, you're getting at the idea that if, if we all got ahead together ahead of time and said, let's all guess zero, because then we'll all get paid. I think actually what happens here is if, if people say zero, then we flip a coin to decide which one person gets paid, but at least we all have okay. a chance. Then we'd all have a chance, yes. Good. We have about um, uh, 17 minutes, yes. Cool. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Sure. So uh, it's a bit about language. So when you think, when people talk about level zero, I think you use the same language too. I think about non-strategic reasoning. In other words, I don't think about how other people reason. Now, a lot of the features that you have actually take into account of how other people may reason, but acknowledge there is a lot of uncertainty about it. Um, so in other words, you may not- Return you, to the very end of the talk. Um, I, I don't want to quite say that. I, I think, these level zero models, whoops, where, where are they, um, allow for the existence of other people, but they all avoid forming explicit beliefs about what those people are going to do, right? So I say, maybe I care about fairness in the, in the sense that I care that whatever outcome happens be good for the other person as well as for me. But I'm not saying I believe that the other person is going to choose the fair outcome and I'm going to respond to that. Let me take something that is a bit easier to think about in fairness. Okay. Uh, uh, you take your maximin, so you may, you may not, you, you may think about other people, but you are unsure, you cannot assign a probability distribution over a single probability distribution over the type distribution of other, other players. Yes. So you might uh, end up uh, as um, playing a maxi uh, maximin, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, similarly, in the mini max regret, uh, you can motivate it similarly. So, uh, and, and I think this terminology is important because um, these are people that may think, but they think in a more in a model that is not identical to the model that you have in mind, but in, uh, they have an, uh, they acknowledge that maybe this is one of the possible models, but there are other other uh, models that other people may play. They don't. They are not certain about the right model. And I think this is this I'm is sure one. I agree with that interpretation about you know uncertainty about the model. Um, there's an interesting conversation to be had there, but I, 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 I'd like to say the, the very last thing in the talk before we talk about this again, because I think it'll, it'll shape what I want to say. Um, I, I shut up. I, no, 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 I'm not trying to shut you down. I just, uh, I'll be interested in what you think about the last thing. Um, I mean, let, let me note that especially once I start taking a weighted uh, sum of all of these different um, behavioral models, you know, this really doesn't look like a response to beliefs, right? You know, 
part of part of me cares about fairness, but then part of me cares about big numbers, and part of me cares about risk, and they're all getting kind of munched together. Like it's it's very hard to see this as a coherent response to beliefs about somebody else. And I it could make, be different. Different. You remember, you have a mixture in the population, so it could be that some people care about one thing, some people yes, care about that's, other features. That that's possible. So. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll get to, I'll, I'll formalize that at the end. I can actually say something more precise about it, but, uh, but for now, let's, let's set it aside. Um, so, um, so at this point, I want to say, look, a, a better model of how people play in a non-strategic way re really made a difference here. Um, but, you know, the, the model that I looked at was pretty ad hoc, right? It's hard to know whether these five features were the ones I ought to have cared about. You know, should it have been linear? Should it have been binary? Um, what's with this informativeness thing? Like, why, why do we do it in quite this way? Uh, and I can tell you, we tried lots of things and it was hard to make it work. And this one was pretty good on the data, but that, that's pretty thin soup, right? That, that's pretty unsatisfying. So, um, you know, how, it, how might we do a more principled search of the space of level zero um, behaviors that, that our models might be anchored in to, to come up with something that makes a bit more sense? You know, I think you can see this as an existence proof that thinking cleverly about level zero might matter to, matter to this family of models, but, but maybe not as hitting it out of the park in terms of how to do this level zero modeling. Um, you know, here we get interested in deep learning because deep learning, uh, you know, essentially is a way of doing feature learning, right? It's a, it's a way of saying, let me take raw signal inputs and, and map them to outputs in a way that kind of automatically searches space of feature representations. And uh, so we got interested in doing this for behavioral models. Uh, this is work with my PhD student, Jason Hartford, um, who is, uh, has a picture here. Um, and I'll, I'll go pretty quickly over this part because we're, we're getting low on time. But I just, I want to tell you that uh, this is a, a kind of non-standard learning approach because we, we want our deep learning models to have properties that deep learning models don't traditionally have. So we want them to be invariant to game permutations because the order in which I specify the rows and columns of the game matrix is unimportant. Um, I want um, the model to have a variable size output because the probability distribution over a player's action space um, depends on the number of rows in, uh, in the given input. So I want it to have this, this variable size input property. Uh, and I want to be able to model iterative strategic reasoning. Um, the, the third point is a bit more technical and I, I, I won't get into it in detail. Um, but basically we, we came up with a new deep learning methodology where at every node in the network, we're passing matrices rather than scalars. So uh, this is a little bit inside baseball for those of you who don't work on deep learning, but um, we're basically passing around entire um, matrices. Um, so matrices of potentials that sort of start out being the, the payoff matrices and get kind of transformed by the network architecture. Um, and, uh, and then we, we use softmax functions to, to map them down to probability distributions at the end. And that's how we get this um, size invariance property because, because we're always maintaining these distributions, these matrices all the way through, we marginalize our one dimension then we get a, an object of the right size at the end. Uh, and we can basically treat that as an action response layer for, uh, for level zero play. Um, we, we have a technical problem that, um, Mathematically, the way this works out is that we end up with every element um, of, of the matrix at a given uh, point, depending only on those elements of the matrix everywhere else. So there's no way where I can do kind of payoff of computations, uh, so payoff comparisons, I mean to say, um, without sort of adding some machinery. So um, without, without getting too uh, into it in a complicated way, we have to add um, Row, row and column wise maximization to be able to make comparisons between each element and the best potential in every row and that, that increases the representational power of the network. Um, then, then we kind of explicitly add in action response layers so that we end up with an architecture like this where, um, where we're given the as inputs the uh, utility matrix for the row player and for the column player. We have a bunch of these kind of feature layers where we uh, end up marginalizing out with softmax and we end up making a uh, level zero prediction for both the row player and the column player. And then we explicitly build in um, action response layers that are able to do kind of best response in the same way that cognitive hierarchy or level K models can do. So, so this whole kind of deep learning architecture gives us a way of essentially learning what level zero people would do um, in a 
in, in this kind of feature learning way where we're not we're not building in these uh, explicit assumptions about fairness or, or whatever else, but we're instead allowing it to emerge directly. Uh, and it's still uh, representationally rich enough, um, you kind of have to believe me because I've glossed over it, but it's able to represent all of the behavioral game theory models uh, that I told you about before. So, you know, all of the, uh, all of the different level zero things that I told you about, all this informativeness stuff, fairness, and um, minimax regret and everything else, all, all this can be expressed using this kind of framework, but it can also discover new features that maybe we didn't know about. Um, so, Never mind that. Let me just tell you how it does. Um, so here's um, so now I've uh, kind of zoomed in on the graph. I've just changed the y-axis here so we can see things a little bit better. So here's uh, the performance of uniform and the performance of uh, so the uniform level zero model is pink and the um, linear uh, model that I showed you before of level zero performance is is blue. You can see, of course, there's no, ver no error across cross-validation splits on the training set, and I'm seeing um, generalization error depending on the splits. You can see the error bars now. Um, and uh, here's what we get uh, in the uh, deep learning model. As I vary the, num the size of the model and the number of hidden units, so if I have one layer uh, with 50 units, two layers with 20 or 50 or 100 units, and three layers, um, and what you can see is um, you know, we're, uh, we're getting much better performance um, with, uh, you know, as we get kind of big enough. Uh, and then at some point when the model starts to have too many parameters, as it has, um, you know, when it has 100 hidden units, it has 100 parameters. So when we have a, a model with 300 parameters, we start to overfit the data. It still looks like it's getting better in the training data, but it starts to generalize poorly. Um, unfortunately, all of this, um, doesn't uh, generalize well um, beyond level zero. So, so we end up building really rich level zero models that, that do better than um, cognitive hierarchy with our previous level zero models, but we aren't able to really find uh, good fits uh, beyond, um, you know, actually have any, any mass given to level one, level two. Um, we think the reason for that uh, is some combination of the level zero model getting so powerful and uh, just not having enough training data to be able to, to fit all these parameters. So that's something we, we would still like to learn more about. But I think what, what this convinces us of is the notion that uh, doing some kind of feature discovery on, on level zero models um, you know, can, can gain something additionally over the models that we showed before. Um, there's one more thing I'd like to say, and I, I have five minutes to say it. So, so let me do that, and then uh, maybe we'll have a couple minutes for questions at the end. So. Something you might be getting worried about uh, that James and I were really worried about was as we make the level zero models more and more fancy, at some point you might worry that they should be, be considered strategic. And this is the, the thing that I wanted to, to reflect on also in response to Joram's point where he was uh, saying, you know, how, how might I you know, give game theoretic interpretations to what uh, these level zero people are doing? Um, you know, what I kind of want to say morally is a level zero agent um, should not be allowed to form an explicit belief about uh, other agents and respond to that belief. Um, but it's hard to know if apparently non-strategic behavior has some kind of mathematically equivalent rephrasing in strategic terms. So that I've sort of smuggled in um, strategic behavior that I didn't really want to think of as being strategic. And you know, if that was hard to think about in the, the level zero model with my handcrafted features, it's almost impossible to think about in this deep learning model. Um, you know, it's hard to look at this crazy soup of, uh, of parameters that I fit and understand whether it's really strategic or not. So um, in the most recent work that James and I've done in this space, um, we propose a, a new formal characterization of non-strategic behavior that cleanly separates um, what, what can be considered strategic from what can be considered non-strategic, that has um, two different properties. Um, it's general enough to call all of the non-strategic decision rules that we would want to consider non-strategic, like Nash or quantal response equilibrium or cognitive hierarchy or any of these models, we call them non-strategic in a precise sense. And, uh, and it, it, it gives a, a explicit functional form for what you're allowed to do in non-strategic behaviors that would allow you to, for example, optimize over the space of non-strategic behaviors in the way that we do here. And 
although we didn't try to bake it in, it turns out that all of the stuff that I'm calling level zero uh, really does, uh, is justified as, as being non-strategic. So um, in one slide, here's how it works. So it says, um, I, I'm gonna call a behavior, uh, a mapping from a game to a distribution like, like we're coming up with here. And what, what I wanna know is whether a behavior is a strategic behavior in the sense that it involves thinking about um, forming beliefs about somebody and responding to those beliefs, or whether it's a non-strategic behavior, which means it, it does something other than that. Um, and here's, um, I'm gonna call an elementary uh, model, um, a, a behavior which I'm gonna claim is non-strategic. So what it does is, given a matrix, it computes some um, function of every outcome in the matrix. So for every tuple of values that occurs uh, in a cell of the, of the game matrix, it's gonna boil that down to a single real value, kind of in any way it wants, but it has to satisfy a no smuggling condition. It sort of looks like continuity. It basically means I can't play kind of real analysis tricks of embedding multiple real numbers in one real number. Um, but essentially anything sensible you would come up with is gonna satisfy this no smuggling uh, property. Um, so then it, I'm gonna take my, um, my tuple of values, I'm gonna turn it into a matrix of single real values, and then I can, which I'll call a potential matrix, and then I can apply any function I want. I can do any computationally complex thing I want to this, um, this function of single, uh, this matrix of single values, to induce eventually a probability distribution over the actions of, of that uh, matrix. And in our paper, we prove that no existing strategic decision rule is elementary. So um, you know, it, the, we would lose information by, by this boiling down of multiple numbers into a single number. Uh, and we can also prove that no elementary model is strategic. Um, formally, what we do is we say, uh, it, it, it can't satisfy a, what we consider to be a necessary, um, a necessary condition for being strategic, which is to be responsive both to the other person's payoffs um, ever, and to be responsive to changes in dominance properties in my own payoffs. Um, and, and further, neither is any function of the predictions of finitely many elementary models. And so it turns out that the, uh, each of those individual five behavioral features that I show you turn out to be elementary because they all boil down to a single number for every outcome. And, and then we aggregate uh, five of them. And, and so that turns out also not to be strategic. Um, so this, this gives us at least, um, you know, as it turns out, sort of a mathematical basis for saying that, uh, that this level zero strategy that we, we had before, this level zero behavior is non-strategic in the sense that it, it doesn't involve forming beliefs about others and responding to it. Um, so let me just put up a conclusion slide so that you can be reassured that I'm ending on time. Um, so I've you know, tried to motivate the idea that behavioral game theory does a better job than traditional game theory for modeling human behavior. Um, I you know, showed you this analysis of uh, different models in the literature, ending up deciding this quantal cognitive hierarchy model does well, but it depends on, on a specification of level zero behavior, which is supposed to be non-strategic. We showed that uh, we can improve its performance by modeling it richly, either by using kind of our own intuition or by using fancy deep learning. And I called out some directions for future research, including you know, at the very end, um, trying to characterize in formal terms what we mean by non-strategic behavior. So I'll leave it there and uh, thanks for your attention. Great, thank you, Kevin. That was really, really terrific. Um, and uh, exactly on time. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll thank you silently, um, uh, unless we want to turn on their, their mics and, and do the clapping thing, uh, but uh, a, a terrific talk, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I think we have one group of people from uh, Nico's group that they're gonna stick around for a few more questions, but uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody else. Thanks so much. Cool, thank you so much for having me and I, I hope someday to uh, meet you in the flesh and yeah. <laughs> go out for drinks after the talk, but uh, Good. Well, have that happy day. Uh, nice to have been here with you now. Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin. Bye everyone. And thanks for the great questions, by the way. <laughs>